Thank you, Hans. And of course, uh, the other doctor in the family, Guchin, who uh, evidently hasn't made it up this morning yet, or at least in the room. Uh, what's that? She will be outside. Okay. Well, uh, I certainly want to th thank her and I want to thank you uh, for the invitation and uh, your friendship and uh, hospitality. It's always uh, anybody who's been in the conference business knows that this is, uh, this is very difficult to pull off and uh, uh, the hoppas make it very, very easy or make it look very easy and it's not. Um, so uh, uh, we're all very thankful. Uh, I don't see her in the room, but I would like it. I think it's been years uh, uh, coming, but uh, I'd like to thank Lala uh, Guchin's daughter for uh, being behind the scenes, uh, keeping, uh, keeping the things moving. Uh, also, uh, the newest member of management uh, Nick Hoppe has been uh, uh, a great addition. Uh, if you haven't met Nick, you should. And of course, the uh, indispensable J only goes by one letter, uh, but uh, J has been uh, here for, for years, and uh, I'm not sure what uh, some of us would have done uh, without him. Have it, that having been said, this is called the uh, the financial newsletter racket. Uh, this is not a, uh, probably one of the more weightier papers that uh, you will hear about this weekend, uh, but hopefully it'll uh, jumpstart uh, the Sunday program. Uh, it is the second series in the racket uh, series. Uh, now uh, it's the second iteration of, of rackets. So those of us of a certain age get emails constantly uh, and, and just three that I picked out to, to begin today's program. Uh, and, and again, uh, this was no extensive search, uh, but the, the first one, this portfolio hasn't lost this century. Uh, is what's being advertised by one the newsletter uh, operator out there. Uh, a second one is, these companies are the future of stocks. They're my moonshots. And of course, my favorite is, be ready to act when the world stops. That's, uh, that's the one you really need to to pay attention to is to uh, uh, get that kind of advice, to be ready to act when the world stops. Now, maybe you were around in 2002 to uh, receive an email from a certain uh, newsletter uh, company, and we will refer to them as the company. Uh, they had a uh, they had a subject line, double your money on May 22nd on this super insider tip. The email claimed analysts at the company had come into possession of certain details of pending approval of a major international agreement that quote will more than or create more than 2.5 billion in profits for one small company, unquote. The email identified the issuer as a company that was involved in nuclear energy and would benefit from the arms reduction treaty behind the US and Russia. May 14, 2002, this email went out and it maintained investors would quote, make a fortune because the company had a senior executive inside the company as a source for its inside information. The company claimed that the executive was definitely in a position to know the intimate details of this agreement. 
and when it uh, and when it would be approved. Therefore, the email announced that the company was in a position to tell you exactly when, all caps, the deal will be finalized and announced to the public. So the email uh, encouraged recipient, uh, recipients to stake their entire investment portfolios on this unnamed company and suggested investors would be able to double their investment dollars in a single day. Finally, the email stated uh, the company can even tell you exactly what day to buy, which was May 21st of 2002, and which day to sell, which was May 23rd. So you buy one day and two days later you would sell. There is actually, there was absolutely nothing else you had to do according to the email. The email did not give the name of the company, but it indicated that it was listed on the NYSE and offered to sell the report, including the name of the company, to subscribers for the princely sum of $1,000. Five years later, the newsletter company paid a $1.5 million fine to the SEC, and by the way, the tip did not pan out. Now, I happened to work for this financial newsletter operator once, uh, and I remember the head man telling us, we are not a financial news service. That's what the, finan uh, that's what the Wall Street Journal is for. We're a marketing company. Subscribers come to us for actionable ideas. The above was an actionable idea that sold over a million dollars in newsletters, according to the SEC. But the head man, he's been quoted as saying, our company publishes ideas, useful ideas, information and opinions that make people more independent, financially, physically, and intellectually. Now, this pitching of actionable ideas has started a long time ago. In fact, in 1862, Mark Twain began writing for the Territorial Enterprise in what was then the richest place on earth, Virginia City, Nevada. And he started as this newspaper reporter, making $25 a week and eventually got a raise to $40 a week. But he didn't need his salary. When he wrote about the mines, speculators would give Twain shares in their mines. He would sell the shares and live comfortably off the profits. Reporters were given shares on the assumption that they would promote the mines in the newspaper. Now, uh, that may seem crazy, but to this day, newsletter writers in the junior gold space, junior resource space, are frequently given shares and warrants to shares to pump up shares in, in their newsletters. So it's a practice that continues until this very day. Now, Twain learned valuable lessons in branding and marketing. He learned to, the value of promoting a product, especially when it was worthless, and how to do so persuasively and with cunning. Mine owners didn't care what the paper reported, provided they just said something. Twain wrote, consequently, we generally said a word or two to the fact that indications were good, or that the ledge was six feet wide, or that the rock resembled the Comstock. And so it did. But as a general, 
Fang, the resemblance was not startling enough to knock you down. If the rock was moderately promising, we followed the custom of the county, using strong adjectives and frothed at the mouth, as if a very marvel in silver discoveries had transpired. If the mine was a developed one and had no payor to show, and of course it hadn't, we praised the tunnel, said that it was one of the most infatuating tunnels in the land, driveled and droveled about the tunnel until we ran out entirely out of ecstasies, but never said a word about the rock. Twain would squander half a column of adulation on the shaft or a new wire rope or dressed pine windlass or fascinating force pump and close with a burst of admiration of the gentlemanly and efficient superintendent of the mine, but never utter a whisper about the rock. Mine owners, Twain wrote, were always satisfied. Occasionally, we patched up and varnished our reputation for discrimination and stern undeviating accuracy by giving some abandoned claim a blast that ought to have made its dry bones rattle, and then someone would seize it and sell it on the fleeting notoriety thus confirmed upon it. Investment money came rolling in, shares kept pushing skyward, even washerwomen and servant girls in San Francisco would pool their money and send agents to buy shares for them. Now Twain, during this time, amassed a box of stock certificates. And in fact, he resigned from the territorial enterprise and he moved to San Francisco. This reminds me of a certain newsletter publisher Publisher might have appeared at this conference once. I'm not sure. Uh, but this newsletter publisher has created the eight P's, the letter P, of resource stock valuation. The first one is people. Who are the key players involved in the company? Number two, the property. Now keep in mind, 95 to 99% of the land owned or controlled by mining companies will never become mines. Financing, with a PH of course, finding financing at a reasonable price. Number four is paper. Some companies will too quickly dilute existing shareholders by raising money from sweetheart financing. That actually should say all mining companies will dilute their existing shareholders. In fact, most mining companies are very inept at mining minerals, they, but they are very adept at mining the pockets of shareholders. Number five is promotion. The fine art of being able to communicate your story to the broad community of investors and analysts. Politics. Research the political climate in a country where your company wants to go mining. And the fact of the matter is, even in the United States, it is very risky uh, to mine. Not as risky as South America, where once you find the material, once you start mining the material, then uh, the government will quickly, uh, or the shareholders can quickly watch the government uh, take over the mine or nationalize the mine and, and lose their investment. Push, something called push, any important development that either adds value to the company or removes a negative. And then, of course, price. A deposit may be worthless 
if the price of an embedded material or minerals is X, but it may become economic if the embedded mineralization goes to 2X, at 3X the project may be worth millions of dollars. But again, through these eight Ps, what is never mentioned is the word or anything about the rock. Now, the business plan for the modern financial newsletter is first you give away something for free. It's a daily newsletter and many of a certain age of us get these newsletters sent to us whether we want them or not. And uh, the free newsletter may give us something amusing to, to read. Uh, in fact, there are uh, at least one attendee at this conference, uh, not necessarily this particular conference, but uh, in years past is, has been in this business. I was on the free end of uh, the free end of the uh, newsletter chain. But what is always gently upsold is the next layer uh, or, or next step, and that is the, the newsletter with some good stuff uh, for $89 a year. And then once you get the $89 a year newsletter, uh, they will gently upsell you, the subscriber, to get the double top secret information to make sure that you get rich and that goes for, say, $999 a year. Now, the managers of these operations constantly hector writers at all stages to provide actionable ideas. The writer doesn't have to be right, but he, if he or she does happen to be right, it will add longevity to the writing career. The company doesn't care how well the, sub, the subscribers do with their investments if they unsubscribe, new writers and new pitches will be, sent, uh, will be found. Pitches like double your money on May 22nd with the super insider tip. Now besides actionable ideas, the other thing that was stressed <clears throat> while I was there is that the writing cannot be too complicated. Writers, uh, the writer's work is run through the flesh Kincaid grade level test. The company wants, wanted our writing to be at the sixth grade level, and certainly more than the eighth grade level. And if it was at the 11th or 12th grade level, that is far too complicated. So for instance, any of the material on the desk out in front of this room that is for sale would be considered too complicated. And in the case of Stefan Kinsella's book, uh, far too heavy. But, uh, <laughs> now, the way the pay worked is that, uh, and using the insider tip case, uh, the newsletter would get 10% of, say, the million dollars that was brought in on a particular idea beyond a, mean, uh, uh, a small salary. Uh, and, but the pitch writer, would also get 10%. It's the person who comes up with the idea to write double your money on May 22nd on this super insider tip. Those are the people that are revered in the newsletter industry. Those are the people the, to, that inspire action from subscribers. And these are the people who are, who are very held in the, the highest esteem. The companies also hold conferences, of course, so subscribers can hear from their newsletter heroes, uh, they passed some symposium recommendations generated and enjoyed gains as high as 167% or 458%. It's always advertised that if you go to one of these conferences, you're going to hear something that you're going to make uh, a lot of money. Uh, Helene Olin <clears throat> has authored a book called Pound Foolish, Exposing the Dark Side of Personal Finance Industry. 
and she interviewed a gentleman by the name of Barry Ritholtz. Um, and, and I've been on at least one panel with Barry. Uh, but he described the whole shebang as a place where, quote, the wealth to unhappiness ratio is simply astounding. And she asked Ritholtz why the well-off would attend such a conference. He replied, talk of doom often appeals to intellectuals and others tra who traffic in ideas. And of course, that may remind us a little bit of yesterday's presentations. Uh, I've heard it said that optimists get rich while pessimists sound smart. And, but in fact, Olin writes, uh, almost all sellers of doom are excellent marketers. In fact, they market every day. They send you an email every day that the world is coming to an end. The, the value of your money is going away. The government's going to steal your money. Uh, and they are relentless and they market you constantly. Speaking of doom and gloom, some of you may remember Howard Ruff, the late Howard Ruff, who wrote a book called How to Prosper During the Coming Bad Years. Now at the time, he, had, he was bringing in $90 million a year from newsletters, boot camps, precious metals company, even a board game called Life is Rough. Eventually, his subscriptions though dropped to, from 175,000 to 3,000, and he would lose his home to foreclosure in the early 2000s. So in 2021, the same company I spoke of earlier that had been fined by the SEC, this time it and several of its affiliates agreed to pay a $2 million fine to settle a Federal Trade Commission charge that they trick seniors into buying newsletters that falsely promised a cure for type 2 diabetes. This, is a, this also is fertile ground in the newsletter business. Not just investments, people aren't just worried about their money, they're worried about their health. So you can always make outrageous claims to them and uh, sell newsletters that way. The offending publication was called The Doctor's Guide to Reversing Diabetes in 28 Days. According to the FDC, the company falsely marketed the doctor's guide as simple and scientifically proven protocol that can permanently cure type 2 diabetes in 28 days without any changes to diet and exercise. That was the beauty of it. The FTC alleged that the defendants falsely touted that 100% success rate and claimed that mainstream treatments were, are ineffective and may even make consumer, or consumers' diabetes worse. The company's marketing materials for the doctor's guide deceptively advertised that the disease, which the company claimed was caused by electronic devices, could be cured by a combination of natural products called Himalayan, Himalayan silk, Epsom blue, and chromonite. In its complaint, the FTC alleged also that the company, as a second group of related defendants, marketed other publications, including a book titled Congress's Secret. Everything's always a secret a secret $1.17 trillion giveaway to consumers that falsely promised it would show them how to claim hundreds of thousands of dollars in which they are entitled in congressional checks or Republican checks. Consumers who bought these products, however, unfortunately found that they merely uh, describe an investment strategy focused on dividend-paying stocks, which would require consumers to risk thousands of dollars to obtain the promised amounts. 
Now back to Mark Twain. Poor Mark. And of course, as hopefully everybody in the room knows, or at least most people know, that Mark Twain was a very famous humorist and probably the, one of the prominent men of letters, wrote Huckleberry Finn and other, uh, other works, at least in the lingua English language. At one time, the Comstock Mines uh, valued at $40 million. And back in the 1860s, $40 million was real money. But the value of those, uh, of those mines fell to $12 million in 1863, and by the end of 1863, they had fallen to $4 million. And during the boom, Virginia City, and if, you've ever, if you ever go there, it's a single street of, uh, of saloons and things, uh, people selling quartz rocks and things like that. It's just a little tourist area. It's a single street. But at one time, it had a population of 25,000 people. But uh, most of them left in 1864 and 1865. Twain recalled that tri the, the wreck was complete. The bubble scarcely left a microscopic moisture behind it. My hoarded stocks were not worth the paper they were printed on. I threw them away. I, the cheerful idiot, had squandered money like water and thought myself beyond the reach of misfortune had not now $50 when I gathered together my various debts and paid them. Now I want to end on a positive note. The company head, the, the, the head man for the company that I've referred to a couple of times with the FTC and the SEC allegations, um, he's, he's still looking. He's looking for copywriters. And there could be copywriters in this room. Who knows? He says, I'm always looking for more copywriters, lots more. There just aren't enough to write the thousands of letters my company needs written every year. And I'm not alone. The whole industry needs more copywriters. He even has something, uh, if, you, if you don't think you have the uh, secret sauce to, to make this happen. Uh, he has a secret. It's called indirection, he calls it. Not straightforwardness or clear writing, nothing like that. He calls it indirection, a copywriting technique that keeps your reader glued to the page by leading him and her seamless, seamlessly through a series of persuasive and compelling ideas. So the good news is, ladies and gentlemen, is that you can buy the secrets to indirection for $29. And you too can be part of the financial newsletter racket. Thank you.